Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. And of all the problems challenging Jewish life today, the single most troubling, controversial, vexing problem remains the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel has been at war, at war, for more than 70 years, from before the formal establishment of the Jewish state in 1948. Every battle in that continuous, continuing war has had a pause, just a pause, affected by an armistice agreement. An armistice agreement does not end a war or end the conflict. It simply suspends it. In 1949, in 1956, in 1967, and in 1973, battles in the Arab-Israeli war ended in an armistice agreement. They did not end in peace negotiations or in peace. Egypt subsequently did make peace with Israel, so did Jordan. But the jihadist Arab Muslim movement, which dominates the Palestinian community, both in Gaza and on the West Bank, has refused to make peace with Israel. And when Hamas brings tens of thousands of Palestinians to the Gaza border, it's not to make peace, it's to win a war by destroying the state of Israel. And when Palestinians from the West Bank hack rabbis to death as they pray in a Jerusalem synagogue, or slit the throat of a three-month-old Jewish baby in her crib, or drive cars and trucks into groups of Israelis standing at bus stops, or blow themselves up in Jerusalem cafes or in Tel Aviv nightclubs, or in social halls where Jews are celebrating Passover, only to be celebrated as heroes by Palestinian leadership, receiving scaled pensions based on the number of Jews they murder or the length of their sentence in an Israeli jail. This heinous murder is not in the cause of peace. It is meant to drive the Jews out of Eretz Yisrael and to destroy any Jewish state anywhere in the Middle East. And yet, the Israeli people and world Jewry remain undaunted in their search for peace with the Palestinians, hoping against hope to find a way for Jews and Palestinians to share the land without enmity, without violence, without war. This is the transcending Jewish obsession, to find a way to live with the Palestinian people in some degree of normalcy. And so most American Jews tend to support the two-state solution, in which the Palestinians would be able to establish their own independent national state on portions of the West Bank. So far, such attempts to implement the two-state solution have failed repeatedly though the two-state solution remains an option in the international community. Some, like the well-known Jerusalem Post columnist Carolyn Glick, have suggested a one-state solution in which the West Bank would become part of Israel and the Palestinians living on the West Bank would have a path to citizenship or would receive economic incentives to leave the West Bank. Still others hold out hope that the Kingdom of Jordan will become an official Palestinian state. And Borelan University's Mordechai Kedar, whom you've seen very often here on JBS, suggests creating Palestinian emirate communities on the West Bank through a series of small Palestinian sovereign regions surrounded by what would be Israeli territory. Thus far, no solution has borne fruit. And now, there is yet another proposed solution 
to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It goes by the name of the New State Solution. I want to show you a video presentation of this New State Solution. Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is often perceived as an intractable deadlock, marked by decades of failed attempts to broker peace. Why does this conflict persist, considering Israel brokered enduring peace deals with Egypt and Jordan, ending decades of hostility? Historically, two dominant alternatives have been promoted for this region, but both were flawed and met only with failure, the two-state solution. This paradigm proposes an Israeli withdrawal to behind the 1949 armistice line in order to create the space for an independent Palestinian state in the area vacated. But such a plan would dramatically weaken Israel's ability to defend itself by leaving it with a nine-mile waistline, placing its main population centers at a topographical disadvantage which could easily be exploited by terrorists or foreign militaries. This plan would also require the relocation of hundreds of thousands of Israelis currently residing in communities in the West Bank. And the two-state paradigm offers no solution to the urgent challenges emanating from the Gaza Strip, which have implications not only for the state of Israel, but for the Gazan people themselves. The Palestinian state would be divided between Gaza and a landlocked West Bank. Making the two contiguous would bifurcate Israel north from south. The one-state solution. This paradigm proposes that Israel unilaterally annex the West Bank and grant citizenship to all its Arab inhabitants. But this plan would involve imposing Israeli citizenship on Palestinian Arabs and therefore would likely increase antagonism as well as create a negative international response. And the demographic shift would dramatically affect and potentially destroy the character of the State of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. But the significant flaws in both solutions do not mean that the region is doomed to endless cycles of conflict. Neither people should have to accept that as their fate. It's time to talk about the new state solution. By merging the Gaza Strip with a repurposed portion of the Sinai Peninsula, a new, thriving, independent, sovereign and viable state can be created for all Palestinians. Egypt and Israel could guarantee respect for and defense of the borders of the new state. Israel, willing Arab nations and the international community could invest in the development of the new Palestinian state and Egypt as the donor state. Technological and logistical support in areas such as water and agriculture could make this desert bloom. The new state's Mediterranean coastline would offer rich opportunities for trade, commerce and tourism. The new state would affix its own migration policy so that anyone wishing to voluntarily relocate there would receive generous absorption and economic packages, setting them and their families on a pathway toward a far brighter future. Israel would retain defensible borders that would not put it at risk and would preserve its Jewish and democratic character. The Palestinians would have a state with a single, contiguous territory within stable and recognized borders, with room for population growth, economic prosperity, and national pride. The forced transfer of any population of either peoples would be avoided. Applying new thinking instead of old slogans could add to the legacy of audacious diplomacy between Israel and her Arab neighbors and usher in a new era of peace and prosperity 
for all in the region. Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. Video presentation of a new state solution. What do you think of it? Well, on this edition of the Chaim, I have the wonderful pleasure of welcoming back a man for whom I have the highest regard, who is a true hero of Jewish life today, and is one of the founders of the New State Solution. His name is Benjamin Anthony. He may be best known to you as the founding force behind one of Israel's most important nonprofit NGO organizations called Our Soldiers Speak, which goes throughout the world, including the United States Congress and college campuses throughout our country, correcting the misconceptions and the lies spread about the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, and the vicious immorality of the BDS movement. Benjamin Anthony made Aliyah as a young adult from Great Britain, and he served as a combat sergeant in the IDF in the Second Lebanon War of 2006, in Operation Pillar of Defense in 2012, and Operation Protective Edge in 2014. He's also served in Judea Samaria, the West Bank, and along Israel's northern border. And Benjamin Anthony continues to serve in the IDF reserves. And he is one of the most articulate and forceful defenders of the state of Israel. And his contribution to Jewish life today is a gift he is giving to the state of Israel and to Jewish history. It is so wonderful, my friend, Thank to have you, you back at this table. Thank you for having me again. I appreciate I, you're, it. You are the day. best in the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and Benjamin Anthony has been kind enough to bring another distinguished colleague with him, one who is also making an enormous contribution to the state of Israel and to Jewish life today. Amir Avivi, a Brigadier General in the IDF Reserves, who brings more than 30 years of military and national defense experience to his work, holding numerous command positions in the IDF's Corps of Engineers, leading thousands of soldiers in the field of combat. Amir Avivi also served in the Chief of the General Staff of the IDF and was at the heart of policy making in the Israeli government and in Israel's defense establishment. What brings him now to his leadership role is the role he plays in the new state solution, serving as the organization's principal operating officer. Amir, it is an honor to have you at this table. Thank you so very, very Thank much. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure. It is wonderful to have you. Thank you. Um, I know something about this guy. Okay? He did a fabulous, he's been on the before, and he sort of gave us a sense of his fascinating journey from Great Britain, the UK, to Israel. I know nothing, though, about your own journey. Where were you born? I was born in Jerusalem. You're a Sabra. I am a Sabra, yes. How many generations of your family have been in Israel? My father's family has been uh, living 15 generations in Jerusalem. That's amazing. Yes, it is. Where were they from originally? Spain. From a little town called Dessa. Very interesting. So you grew up in Jerusalem? Well, I grew up most of my childhood outside of Israel. My father is a diplomat. He served uh, 51 years in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Really? What's his name? Vini Avivi. Is he still alive? Of course he is, yes. That's wonderful. And so he served as a diplomat in what countries? Well, he served as Israel's ambassador in Turkey, in Chile, and in Colombia. And you went with him? I went with him, yes. You have siblings? Oh, I do. How uh, many? I have a sister. She's four and a half years younger than me, Mira. What does uh, she do? She works at a high school. Okay. In a Mebaseret. Very nice. And uh, my young brother, Yehuda, followed my father's step, and he's today the spokesman in the Israeli embassy in London. Fascinating. What was it like for you growing up in Israel? You, you know, I, I can't quit do it fast enough. When you're a teenager, what decade are we in? 
80s. In the 80s. Okay. So it's after the Yom Kippur War already. Yes. Do you remember the Yom Kippur War? No. At the time, uh, Yom Kippur War, uh, we were in Ivory Coast. I see. When did you come back to Israel? I came back at the age of 12 from Argentina. Yes. For three years. Yes. And at the age of 15, once again... Uh, off you went. We went off to Rome, where I had the pleasure of studying in a British high school. Okay. Now you ultimately come back to Israel because you serve in the IDF. Yes, I returned at the age of 18. Yes. My parents still stayed in uh, Rome one more year, so I enlisted as a, well, as is known as a Chayal Boded, a lonely soldier. Lone soldier. And uh, joined the combat engineers. You have a master's and a BA, right? Yes. Okay. And in engineering, in essence? No, I studied political science, a BA and, M and the master's degree. So how are you in the engineering corps? Well, it's combat engineers. It's less engineering and more combat. Is it really? Yes. I see. You saw combat as well as Benjamin seeing combat? I've seen a lot, yes. I'm sorry. So uh, at what point do you become interested in this idea of a new state solution that Benjamin creates? I've been following for many, many years uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, I got to the conclusion uh, as soon as Oslo started that something there is not working at all. Mm -hmm. it took me maybe six months uh, after I saw Arafat uh, arrive, arriving to Gaza to see that this is not really working. And uh, I thought a lot about what, what would be the best solution. And I believe that like in business, you need a solution that meets real interests, that creates real value for all sides, and this is what we are doing. Benjamin, how did the idea come to you? Well, <clears throat> the idea came to me because of the work that I undertook on the university campuses. Through the organization, which is a separate organization, Our Soldiers Speak, I've been to more, than, more than 450 campuses mm -hmm. to date. All over the world, really? All over the world, uh, all over the English-speaking world. Fair enough. And uh, one of the questions that, that recurred almost from the outset was, what's my view on the two-state solution? So there are three precursors to the new state that I'll run you through very quickly. The first inc incarnation of me speaking to this issue was that I would give the audience five reasons for it, five reasons against it, and leave them to make up their own minds. Five reasons for? The two-state solution, two states five, five reasons against Got it. it, and defer to them to affix their own opinion. All the while, internally, I was opposed to it, incidentally. Which because? Is well, I'm, I'm opposed to the two-state solution because of a number of reasons. Number one, it's not offering two states. It's offering one state for the states of Israel and a sub-state to the Palestinian Arabs. And I'm also opposed to the formula, formulation of it. I'm opposed to the idea that a state should be established on the back of Jewish people abandoning where they currently live. I do not support, under any circumstances, the partitioning of Jerusalem. I think that would be a fatal blow to the existence of the states of Israel and the continuity of the Jewish people globally. And, there, and I don't believe the two-state solution would render Israel with defensible capabilities as a, is required, especially in this epoch of failing states. And General Aviv can speak to that aspect of it. There are numerous reasons, but I'll, I'll keep running you as to how I got to the new state solution. I realized that audiences were dissatisfied with that because they don't need me to give them five reasons to make an opinion. And so I moved and I said that I'm opposed to the two-state solution, and I gave them ten reasons. Ten reasons from my perspective, expressing that I wasn't seeking consensus. I was seeking for them to understand I was being candid with them. The third incarnation was that I would say status quo and almost flippantly say, mm -hmm. the status quo is great, and we can talk about two states, but one of those states should be in Syria or Jordan. Or I was very, very dismissive of the idea. And then it came to a presentation at Harvard, and I was not satisfied with that response. I realized that it was not acceptable to be the party of no. You were not satisfied with I was with not satisfied with response. my own response. In fact, I was not just dissatisfied, I was deeply troubled by it because I realized that I would not accept it were I an audience member. And I needed to find an answer that at once would give satisfaction to an audience member and also remain consonant with my own beliefs. Okay, pause for one moment. Yes. You're saying you're at Harvard, and yes. the position you're espousing is? Status quo. Keep things just as they are, we can exactly live with it. Exactly as they are, yes. And something about that troubles you? Yes. What? 
It troubles me that it doesn't offer a vision for a brighter future. For whom? The Israelis and for the Palestinian Arabs. Okay. Yeah. And that troubled me. And incidentally, I was rather surprised that that troubled me, that it did. You were surprised at yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was surprised by it. And of course, I have the privilege that many people don't, which is that I get to learn from an audience. You know, I'm not sitting in a room sealed off. I'm, I'm interacting with people who are very educated on these subjects. They help me to refine these ideas by way of sometimes adversarial questions. And so what happened as a consequence was that I literally poured over a map and thought about where might this actually be? Where could this be done? Perhaps not a perfect solution, in need certainly of refinement, in, the, in need of constant evolution and refreshment, but an idea, a vision that presents that brighter future that's absent the status quo paradigm. And the obvious place upon closer analysis, as, as one of our other contributors to this idea, was hiding in plain sight. And it is, in our opinion, and I stress our, we are not alone in this, it is in the Gaza Strip with contiguity into a coastal part of the Sinai Peninsula, about 10% of the Sinai Peninsula, incidentally. And this would offer a, a, a state mark that is independent, viable, sovereign, thriving for the Palestinian Arabs, living side by side with the state of Israel. Incidentally, one thing before you before I welcome any more questions you have, we're not calling for peace. Now, you made a very, very insightful introduction to this discussion, which alluded to the notion of peace several times, and I understand it. But I actually believe that peace belongs in Tinseltown. I don't think it belongs in the Middle East, and I don't think it's necessary. I think quiet would do the trick. General Avivi thinks quiet would do the trick, and that's what we're yearning for, two yes. states living side by side. Boy, I am convinced that, they, that you're right. Thank you. We really are talking about the, act, the absence of conflict. Absolutely, okay. a conflict-ending idea. Okay. Um, all right, Benjamin, it's no secret. You know it well. You know, I think the world of you. But I want to push you here, and I want to see if I understand. And I'm imagining what the audience might be thinking. It's a very idealistic plan, suggestion, proposal. I see problems with it, and I want you to respond, either of you to respond. Yeah. Why is there no peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Well, I think that the problem starts in 1936 with the idea that you are taking a country with the width of 43 miles and you want to stick two fast-growing nations, each one with the last large diaspora, in this tiny, tiny area. But this is impossible. It's impossible to put two states in an area of 43 miles. So basically, each side, in order to become viable and sustainable, needs most of the area for itself. And each side is trying to get most of the land for itself. No, I want to stop. What's your answer to that same question? Why is there no peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Well, I, I think there's no peace between the Israelis and Palestinians because it's an ethereal notion. I think that there's conflict for various reasons. There can be, those can be tribal, religious, territorial, in terms of what they're predicated upon. But I think that exclusively with the State of Israel, there seems to be this expectation that specifically there, a perfect peace can come about. And I, I don't think that's realistic. Okay. Why has there not been a two-state solution after all these 70 years? Well, in my own view, one of the reasons is because it puts on the table certain things that neither side is able to sell to its people. What can't the Israeli government sell to the Israeli people? Jerusalem. No Israeli government, for example, you know, we often hear, Mark, the idea that Clinton was at Camp David with Barak and with Arafat, and they were very, very close, and that Arafat wouldn't accept the deal and walked away from the table, and I'm sure all of that's true. But I also want to draw people's attention to the fact that when Barak tried to sell the idea of partitioning Jerusalem to Israelis, he couldn't do it. He was deposed because of that. Rose Sharon, as a consequence of that, the Israeli people are not in the business of partitioning Jerusalem. And neither leader, so-called, from either side, uh, has managed to sell an idea such as that. And it's important to see that. Okay. That's just one idea. Okay. I want to give you my answer, and you can tell me where you think I'm wrong. 
I may agree with you. We'll see. Okay. We'll see. I disagree strongly with your perception of the Israeli people. I believe, you have any children? I do. Four. Four children. Have they served in the IDF? Two of them are serving currently. You like it? I like it. I'm proud of them. I know Very you're proud. proud. You, you want them to be, if, if you had your choice, should every Israeli child grow up and serve in the IDF and be in combat like you were? Well, of course I would like them to live in peace and not having to of serve Of course in. you would. Of yeah. course you would. Okay. I don't know any Israeli who tells me different. Every Israeli I talk to says, I don't want my children. And the, the dream of Israel has been the next generation will not have to do what I have to do. Mm -hmm. I am convinced, and by the way, at one point during Oslo, at the height of Oslo, the most optimistic moment of Oslo, at least 80% of the Israeli people were in favor of a two-state solution, and they want Jerusalem, they can have Jerusalem, they can have the Temple Mount, just no more war. Then it fell apart for a whole host of reasons. I don't believe the Israeli people are any different today than they were then, except they no longer believe there's an interlocutor on the other side that really wants to make peace. But Benjamin, if the Israeli people believed that there was a leadership in the Palestinian world that meant it, that meant no more war, whatever the peace is, we, the fighting stops, you'll live, we'll live, and your children will not have to go to war. And it means a Jerusalem, uh, a divided Jerusalem. They can have a divided Jerusalem. They can have the Temple Mount. They can have the West Bank if they mean it. And there's only one reason there isn't. The Palestinian movement, leadership, doesn't want it. They don't want any peace with you. you give them anything you want. There's not one thing you can ever give them will be enough. The only thing that will be enough is if you go away. And when you're dealing with a people whose ultimate answer is you don't belong here. You and you and your father and your grandfather, even from the time they came from Spain till today, you took my land. That's what they'll tell you. And I got a key to the house you're in. This key used to open your house. I can't use this key because you're in it. This is why. And, and, Ari Shavit writes a book, My Promised Land, in which he says, the Jews stole a land from a people and destroyed an indigenous people. I find that outrageous on his part, historically outrageous. And he got a lot of kudos in the American Jewish community, especially on the American left. It's outrageous. But that's the Palestinian mentality. The Palestinian mentality is, you took my land. Oh, you want to make a compromise? Isn't that nice of you? You mean you'll give me back some of my land? Aren't you sweet? No. It's my land. Get out of my land. By the way, you think the Palestinian is going to be happy giving up Nablus and Ramallah and living on the Gaza border as lovely as it could be? By the way, Sharon takes all of every single Jew out of Gaza, every Israeli soldier out of Gaza, leaves, leaves the infrastructure in place. There are billionaires that are ready to turn it into Monte Carlo on the Middle East. And the Palestinians said, no, no, we'd, well, no, no, no. We'd rather build tunnels into Israel and we'd rather spend our life winning our land back. Tell me I'm wrong. Definitely you're wrong. Okay, and thank oh, you for, for opening it up. And you, first of all, I should put a, a, an important disclaimer out there. I'm not the only Jew in the state of Israel, and I've heard you say this many, many times on your show, of which I'm a fan. I am not the only Jew in the state of Israel who absolutely rails against this notion 
of? That by sharing the land in the pursuits of peace, everybody would accept it. There are certain things I wouldn't accept. I would not accept the partitioning of Jerusalem. I would never accept the further expulsion of Jewish people from their homes. I think that has brought about a rend in the fabric of the Israeli people from which we have not yet recovered. Oh, a two-state solution does not require expulsion. Uh, yes, it does. It speaks to it. It speaks to it, by the way, politely and openly. And I'm appalled, incidentally, not, not at you, Mark, but I'm appalled that in many, many circles such an idea is spoken as though it be the civilized opinion. Yes. Now I want to carry on with... with but I just want to make sure we understand. Yeah. Responsible is really position is, if there's going to be a two-state solution, mm -hmm. the Palestinian state has to allow Jews to live there, just as Jews allow... Palestinian Arabs to live in Israel. No, that's one opinion. This that's is not one the opinion. plans that are being presented today. The plans are that are being presented today is at least 120,000 Jews will be thrown from their homes. This By is whom? the minimum number. By whom? By whom? the state of Israel. You're telling me that the Israeli government has made a formal proposal that it will make a two-state solution on condition, with a condition, that it will remove 120,000 Israelis from the no, West Bank. I'm not saying the Israeli government right. has done it, but it, yes. I'm saying that all the major think tanks, yes, all they the left-wing parties... I only care about you and me. The think tanks are anti-Semitic, and they don't want peace for you. I want to hear what this man thinks and what you think. We at this table believe, if there ever were to be a two-state solution, I don't believe there can be with the present Palestinian leadership. They have an obligation to permit Jews to live on the West Bank, just as we allow Israeli Arabs to live. I, in think, our I think this is really, with, with the greatest of respect to whomever is um, propagating an idea such as that, this is purely academic nonsense. What you mean it'll never happen? No, it should never happen. It should never happen that I, I have members of my close circle who live in communities in Judea and Samaria. They moved to the state of Israel. They did not move, for example, to Malea Dumim or to Givat Ze'ev in order to live as part of the Palestinian state. And an Israeli government, incidentally, that would consider switching their nationality and the, uh, their nationality and their citizenship to a Palestinian. They would be mean Israeli citizens. It would be absolutely appalling. No, they cannot live beneath a Palestinian flag. There's no uptake on the other side for Why such Why can't an they idea. live under a Palestinian There's flag? There's simply no uptake on the other side for such an yes, idea. Yes, but that's my point. No, that's part of the point. But no. I want to come back about Jerusalem, okay. Mark. I, I want to speak about that. You asked uh, General Avivi a very, very important question. Would he like his children to go to the military or not? But that's, that's a question in isolation. The idea of seeking different conflict-ending alternatives to the status quo is not ex mutually exclusive from the idea of a father not wanting his children to go to the military. I'm sure if you broaden the question, for example, and you said to General Avivi, General Avivi, what scenario do you prefer? Do you prefer a situation whereby the Israeli people are in charge of their own destiny, including the need to rise and take up arms when necessary to defend and protect themselves and fly their own future? Or do you prefer this, the people of Israel to be embattled, endangered, and unable to repel threats? I'm sure he would choose the former. Maybe we should ask him. No, but we, all would, we, we all would choose the former. But that's not the, the option. The option is no more conflict. No more conflict. Mm -hmm. And there's... East Jerusalem, there's the capital of the Palestinian state. If, there, if you knew your children, your grandchildren, your wife, would never face conflict from the Palestinians, they would honestly live with peace, in peace with you. By the way, they're going to have a state on the West Bank, and they're going to have their capital in East Jerusalem. Is East Jerusalem alone enough for you to say, oh, no, I will not make peace with them? They're willing to make peace with you, honest peace with you. They're willing to make peace with you. They want one thing in addition. They want their capital in East Jerusalem. You have a choice. Peace, and they get East Jerusalem, or no peace, and you keep East Jerusalem. What do you say? I think that your question is maybe the most problematic issue. I know. <laughs> uh, talking about the way the whole, all of this conflict is perceived. The idea 
that you can sign with somebody everlasting peace. There is no everlasting peace in this world at all. So the question is, when you uh, present a program, you need to think what will happen in the future. And what will happen if there will be war? Will you be able to defend yourself or not? Israel has no possibility to defend itself in the nine miles width of a uh, border. This well, is you're impossible. You're a general in the IDF. Can you explain to me, and I am not expressing my own opinion here, but I am expressing the opinion of others were they at this table, that say to you, there is a gaggle, a gaggle of Israeli generals who say modern warfare, what you're talking about is no longer relevant. Wouldn't matter whether you had nine miles or 90 miles. You'll always be, if, there, if the Palestinians and the Arab world wants to come after you, it doesn't matter if it's nine miles or 90 miles. Why does a gaggle of Israeli generals say you're wrong? For the very reason that we were talking before about the prior question. Because they think that this will be the end of conflict and there won't be any wars. Now, this is a very problematic way mm -hmm. of thinking. Mm -hmm. They're Today, idealistic, huh? Yes, and I think that if you really look at it militarily speaking, I can tell you that th this border can't be defended. You, d you don't have even where to put the f your forces. What will we do? Uh, ro route 6 will become uh, the border, and then Route 4 will become uh, the place where they, you, you, you put the soldiers. There is no state. It's not viable. And I think, and I think that uh, Rabin, when he forwarded the idea of Oslo, he knew that. This wasn't the idea of Oslo. Oslo was talking about a small sub-state, uh, some kind of autonomy uh, for the Palestinians in the West Bank. It was supposed to be, and they still are, completely surrounded by Israel. Israel will always, always hold the, the river of Jordan. And therefore, there's two sides to it. First of all, Israel understands, and most of the Israelis understand what they need to be safe. And they need large parts of uh, Judea and Samaria, and certainly the Jordan River. This is how, how we, we are placed today. The other thing is that Tzhak Rabin, even after signing the Oslo Agreement, said, and he said it all the time until his last day, Jerusalem is out of the question. This is the heart of the Jewish people. And I think that if the Palestinians want to thrive, they need to build their own, st own, own story. They can't build that narrative on Jewish history. By the way, I agree with you a thousand percent, but I didn't hear your answer to my question. If you knew your children for uh, 90 years, 90 years, three generations of your kids won't have to fight. And there'll be a Jerusalem cap, a Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem. Amir, do you say no? I'm saying no. Interesting. Well, you were right. He said no. No, no. Just, just, just sort of <laughs> first of all, it's nice to be right and from and time to time. And it's not only I. It's important He's not to alone. understand. He's not alone. I'm not uh, what you would call the extreme right or something like that. I'm the average Israeli. Okay? And the average Israeli would He's say not the average Israeli. No. <laughs> But I, but I want to tell you something about that. I, I'm, I'm not willing to move on from this issue of Jerusalem okay. just yet. I want to make it absolutely clear where I stand. Please. Uh, you asked me the question. Uh, first of all, in, in my humble opinion, no Israeli leader, including the incumbent, including whomever pre came before and whomever comes after, has any remit whatsoever to bargain away Jerusalem. I think that to bargain away J Jerusalem is to carve up the heart of the people of Israel. It's to dissect the heart of the state of Israel. And I am absolutely convinced that the broader organism around it would die as a consequence of it. Not only that, it's very important in this world as a Jewish person to have just a touch of humility. If for generations and for millennia, unlike the Palestinian Arabs incidentally, we have been yearning towards Jerusalem as our capital, it's not for a fleeting moment in history, perhaps during a four-year tenure, to put that up for bargaining. And I actually think that one of the greatest tragedies is that it's from our own people 
some living in the states of Israel, but a great many, many living beyond the borders of the states of Israel, who when this idea comes up for discussion, rather than dismissing it with all of the vigor that it ought to be dismissed, they actually lamentably turn around and they say, let's talk about that. And you know why? Because they are willing to deal in this fantasy idea that an ethereal peace will break out over the state of Israel with a people who have demonstrated absolutely no form for such a thing. And they are willing to entirely separate themselves from the idea that there is a that there is a higher purpose to our presence there in Israel and there is a different type of progress and a different type of advancement that is coming as a consequence of the meeting of a people with its land and a land with its people. And when people talk about, you know, removing 100, 120,000 Jews from Judea and Samaria or putting them under the flag of the Palestinian state, they are wrenching, they, they are amputating the heart the soul of Judaism from the people of Judaism. They are, they are bifurcating a people from its conscience, from its history, and most importantly, Mark, in my opinion, absolutely decidedly and finally, from its future. So please understand that I know that it makes for comfortable airplay when Jewish people say, yes, of course, we'll share the land. And so we're not talking about sharing the land. We're talking about ripping people from their homes and giving away our heart and soul. And I'm afraid I have to oppose that. And okay, I, always I must say that the amazing thing about what Benjamin said is that at the end of the day, they're also, having doing that, they're not offering anything to the Palestinians. I'm sorry, who is now offering? Oslo. Yes. The Palestinians really are asking for one thing. OK, I, I agree with everything you said about them. I'm not arguing. I know who they are, OK? I know who we're dealing with. But at the end of the day, if we want to detach from our feelings for a moment, okay, look at it uh, on the side. They want real sovereignty. Oslo. Where? First of all, real sovereignty. Where? Well, they are splitted into two. Half of them are in the West Bank, half are in Gaza. Everybody well, is trying. Where do they want their sovereignty to be? Well, depends who you ask. If you ask Hamas, this is one answer. They are in Gaza. And if you ask the Palestinian Wait, Authority, you don't think Hamas wants answer. Eretz Israel? I think that Hamas wants Eretz Israel, and Fine, I think that the Israelis... And what is the Fatah And I think want? that the Israelis want Eretz Israel. And what does Fatah want? They want it as well, but this is not the issue. Why isn't it this, the issue? This isn't the issue. This you've is got, the understanding... You've got two Palestinian groups who are at war with each other, but they share one common interest. They want no Jew anywhere in Eretz Israel. It's their land, and they want you out. Okay, so we are playing now a zero-sum game, right? which Israel is winning at the moment, right? and will win also Th in the future. That's the status quo he once argued for. OK, yes. Once, once argued. I heard yes. once. Right. But <laughs> the whole global scenario has changed. The region is changing. There are new interests. And this gives Israel an opportunity not to give anything important, gain a lot, but also push forward an idea that is not status quo. What and this is big news because I want to tell you something. When we present the new state solution, wherever we present it and whenever we present it, whether it's a liberal crowd, whether it's a conservative crowd, whether it's a mix of them, they all relate to it. And this is huge news because what interests me long before we are talking about Palestinians or Americans or Europeans or even Egyptians is bringing together the people of Israel to agree on a solution that does two things. It gives the people of, of Israel everything they would dream about and are dreaming about. But they will, it also gives them the possibility to help create a viable Palestinian okay. state. And, and this is big news. OK, and I want to I make sure I am clear. If you could implement the new state solution, it would be a dream. There's, it's brilliantly presented in that video. Great voiceover, by the way. <laughs> it's a brilliant video. It is idealistic. And all, we just need one thing. We need the Palestinians to agree. And I don't, you know, for all of the profound wisdom that the both of you have, and when you disagree with me, I'm, I'm, you can disagree with me. But I, I say to myself, it, for, your, for your plan to be implemented, 
It's not about whether the Israelis like it. Of course the Israelis will like it. It's whether, it's whether Palestinians are going to like it. What's to, if, the, if you're the Palestinians, explain to me if you're the Palestinians. Why do you like the idea the Jew ultimately gets the land they believe are theirs? They get Jerusalem, which they believe is theirs. Unbelievably, but they believe it's theirs. And they have to leave. They have to, not only do they leave Nablus and Hebron, and they also don't, they don't get good to go back to Jaffa. They don't get to go back to Haifa. They've got to go to a new place. It isn't their home. They don't think of it as their home. So is, aren't you nice? We'll make peace with you if you Palestinians give up everything you've ever wanted and move to Gaza. If they said yes, it's a machaya. Mazal tov. You, you should get the Nobel Peace Prize. But explain to me, either of you, why in, what in the world makes you think the Palestinian people or the Palestinian leadership would want your plan? Just before I come to that, and I absolutely will, and generally you're welcome to, to take whichever aspect you wish, of course, I do want to address myself to something that shouldn't pass without being challenged. Sure. Um, you made mention of this idea of a gaggle of generals yes. who are running around saying that in modern warfare, X, Y, Z yeah, is possible. We're told no that threat. all the time. Okay. First of all, we are not alone at this table. There is a bank of individuals who see things differently. But much more importantly, a number of the people who are within our working group in the New State Solution were listed as generals belonging to organizations such as those that you're referencing. They didn't even know they were on the list. Can so you the, get any of them to say that on L'Chaim? To say what, which part of it? That to, they didn't even know they were on the yeah. list? And that they well, are now, although they're often quoted by the Peter Beinerts Yes, of I'll give you a perfect example of it, okay? And I, and I will absolutely accept your invitation. And I know it's a genuine invitation. Absolutely. So one of the latest additions to the working group is a gentleman by the name of Yaakov Perry. Now, Yaakov Berry is a former head of the Shin Bet. He was a major feature in a very controversial film that was called The Gatekeepers. You may yes. have seen The Gatekeepers. Yes, I did. Now, Yaakov Perry was the darling of Jeremy Ben-Ami and J Street because he absolutely spoke to the two-state solution, expressed the need for us to enter into a two-state solution, spoke about the viability of a two-state solution, and has now completely disavowed that idea and is on record on our website writing for the new state solution. Now, this is a man whose expertise I would put up against anybody's, quite frankly, as I would, by the way, General Avivis. I'll give you another example of that. Uh, General Shachal Shohat, Brigadier General Shachal Shohat, retired, is the immediate past commander of the Israel Air Defense Forces. Now, this example is critical to an American audience. Are you only American, by the way, or are you international? No, we're now international. Wonderful. So I hope <laughs> this permeates even beyond the bounds yes. of the great United States of America. General Shachal Shohat, is, as I said, the immediate past commander of the Israel Air Defense Forces. He was the individual in charge of those defense forces during Operation Protective Edge in 2014. He puts a very clear paper, it's on the website for people to look at, as to the dangers of giving away the advantage given to the State of Israel by having the high ground on the hills of Judea and Samaria, and the advantages that the new state solution would grant when it comes to air defense. Now, the reason I make mention of him specifically is that many, many people in the American Jewish community believe that all of air defense is now taking... I don't expect you're of this view, by the way, because I know how, how familiar you are with the situation. But there's almost a complacency that's set in that seems to suggest that the Iron Dome has everything covered. And it's not the case. It has a specific issue resolved in part, not thoroughly, and it is rendered less than effective on other issues. So when you have people like a Yaakov Peri, like a General Shachal Shohat, and, and like a General Amir Avivi, and also a former head of the intelligence of the Israel Defense Forces, all rallying around this, rather than, with the greatest of respect, generals who retired in 1973, and I, and I don't say that dismissively. I thank them for all that they did. I think it's time to open a conversation with a new bank of experts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm confident that the expertise that we're able to present at least holds its own and even supersedes that brought to the table by others. Well, I love what you say. I'd love to see if we could do some 
some of that on JBS. I'd, I'd be delighted. Okay. Now come back to my other question. Why would a Palestinian, with a Palestinian community, Palestinian leadership and community, ever buy into the new state solution? Okay, so I'm going to deal with the people, and then I'd like General Levy to speak to the leadership, if that's okay. Let me, let me just correct uh, a, a, a misconception. And I, and I do this with all the deference in the world to, to you. It is a grave error to speak in monolithic terms about peoples. A grave error. And uh, so when one says, for example, the Palestinians want, the Palestinians say, the Palestinians are after, the Palestinians seek, the Palestinians demand, my response to that is some of them do, others do not. I normally refer to the Palestinian leadership. Tell me right. who in the Palestinian leadership. But no, General Avivi will deal with the leadership. I won't deal with the peoples because this is a very, very important point because it moves beyond rhetoric. And I don't say that in a disrespectful manner. I want to move beyond the rhetoric and I want to look at what's happening now. For years, for years, people said that I want to take Jerusalem as the issue because Jerusalem is the hot button issue, if, if I may put it that way. People said for years that if a president should recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel, the whole Middle All East hell will, will break absolutely. loose. You, you know this better than yes. I know it. Now, I want to talk about two points, and then I'm going to bat the ball over to the general. President Donald Trump did two things, two different things. The first was that he came out and he said, I recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel. Words without deeds, but significant words. As a direct consequence of that, the leader of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, said, I want riots in the streets, demonstrations, intifadas, so on and so forth. And when he made that appeal, he was making that appeal to a specific demographic, 18 to 35-year-olds. These, after all, are the people, the young men who are willing to go forward, typically. What ultimately came from that? Basically nothing. Basically nothing. A few demonstrations here and there, but nothing of real significance. Then you move to something altogether more controversial, the actual dedication and opening of an embassy in Jerusalem. And Hamas said, there were other things that were going on beforehand, we all know the context, but Hamas said, we will have a quarter of a million people on the border, rioting, storming the border, as a result of this opening of the embassy. And what happened? About 20,000. Now, 20,000 is not an insignificant number. It's not a number that we don't have to look at and take very, very seriously. But inclusive of all of the payments and all of the inducements and all of the duress that was employed to send those people to the fence, 20,000 in the case of the Gaza Strip and next to nothing in the case of Judea and Samaria tells me that the average Palestinian is not willing to spill their blood for the rhetoric of an aged, I would say illegitimate leadership, they are willing to see things anew. And I actually, and this may surprise you, I don't believe that the Palestinian people are any more or less monolithic than are the Jewish people. Look at our disagreement here. We disagree on central issues. I think it's absurd to suggest that they all have one viewpoint, and I actually believe there are some Palestinians who will forever wish to stay in Judea and Samaria, and they can stay. Nobody's calling for a forced transfer, by the way, under any circumstances. I also believe there are Palestinian Arabs who would be very, very happy to have a stake in a resort on the beach along a beautiful shoreline. I can bear that out if you want me to, but I'd like yes, to... Yes, I want to, because they could have had it in Gaza already. No, it's different, Mark. Why? It's not the same thing, and, and, and this is something that... that the general and I have explained to people, and it's been accepted by people. There are many, many so-called pandits who look at the Gaza Strip as precedent for something. And I'll look at it from two different angles. Number one, I hear people right at the forefront of the Israel conversation in the diaspora who say, when it comes to withdrawing from, they call them settlements, I call them communities. When it comes to withdrawing from communities, we have a clear precedent that this can be done, the Gaza Strip. That is no precedent whatsoever. That was about 15,000 people. It caused, as I said earlier, a tear in the Israeli fabric from which they have rightly not yet recovered. 
They were not treated correctly. They were not housed correctly. They were not given economic viability. They were not given the basic things that they ought to have had as compensation, not justification, but compensation for what occurred over there. Okay? 15,000. You're talking about 100,000 in Judea and Samaria who have learned the lessons of the Gaza Strip. So to think that that is transposable is utterly flawed, but more than that, much more than that. The basic mistake, and, uh, and I, I really would like to hear from uh, General Abivi on this particular point, is if there's one thing we ought to have learned from the Gaza Strip, it is the dangers of unilateral withdrawal. We saw that unilateral withdrawal without an agreement has resulted in complete anarchy without any responsibility of statehood upon Hamas whatsoever. By the way, we saw the very same thing in Lebanon, unilateral withdrawal, withdrawal of Israeli troops and of an Israeli presence there. And the result is about 120,000 rockets just waiting to be launched towards us. So when we talk about a state, of course part of that state is that it's ratified, recognized, and agreed as the state for the Palestinian Arabs in a bilateral sense or potentially trilateral. So that's the peoples. I believe the peoples are there to, be, to have a discussion with. We have to pause for a moment. You've been kind enough to say you will stay with me. So we're going to pause right here. When we pick it up, it'll be your turn to talk about my question. Will a Palestinian leadership ever be willing to accept the new state solution? The thoughts of two remarkable individuals who are making a transcending contribution to the state of Israel and to the Jewish people. Benjamin Anthony, founder of Our Soldiers Speak and of the New State Solution, and Amir Avivi, principal officer of the New State Solution. I hope you've enjoyed hearing the first part of their approach to their plan to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to some extent. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with your reactions to their new state solution thus far, or to any of the ideas expressed here on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I'd love to read some of your thoughts on JBS. Until the next time, with the General and the Sergeant, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. Time is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.